Are we ready? Is everyone having a good time? Welcome to the, what is it? Oh, we're using social media effectively panel. Um, I'm Avins O'Brien. I guess I am moderating this panel. I think uh, earlier in the day or the weekend, there have been panels about like social media censorship and all that. So if those haven't like completely gotten you to like remove yourself from social media, uh, these guys are here to talk to, uh, uh, to you about how to use social media effectively until you're banned from it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so to start, we're gonna go with, let's see, Ron. It would help if I had pulled up your butt. You know what? This is Ron and he's going to introduce himself and give him a second and tell you about him and then he's going to do his little uh, presentation. All right. In 2016, uh, I was Senator Ted Cruz's presidential campaign spokesman. I've also run for Lieutenant Governor of California, was chairman of the California Republican Party. Uh, and so for me, my digital presence uh, is very important uh, for me. And so for this panel, I wanted to come up with what is one thing uh, that one particular technique that you may not be using. Um, at conferences like this, there's always tons and tons of, you know, how to use social media. Well, you should have an Instagram account. You should have a Twitter account. You should, like, we, we know that all that by now. We've been doing that for enough years. So now what we should do is go down a little bit deeper and to see what is a particular technique that we might be able to use that we may not be using or may not be aware of so far. So can someone, you don't have to use the app for this. We'll just do this on the honor system that no one's going to give a speech. Uh, can someone name a search engine? Google, okay. YouTube. YouTube. Can someone guess what the what is the lar what is the biggest search engine on the internet? The most popular one is Google. What's number two? YouTube. YouTube. So the first thing is we should think about YouTube is a search engine, and very often people don't think of it as a search engine. That uh, they don't necessarily have to have a presence there. Well, here's a couple statistics as it relates to YouTube. It's the world's second largest. A billion hours of video is watched a day, more than Netflix and uh, Facebook video combined, uh, by 30 million users per day, 1.3 billion users uh, total as of the last um, most recent uh, usage data. 300 hours of video is uploaded every minute onto YouTube. 300 hours of content every minute. And given that we're speaking to an international audience today, there is con local versions in 88 countries and 76 different languages can be used to navigate it. And the average mobile viewing session, by the way, is 40 minutes. So think about the number of people who are cord cutting. So at home, I no longer have cable TV service. I only have internet service at home. And YouTube is an app on my Apple TV, and I watch YouTube as a television channel uh, all of the time. Look at this. 19% of YouTube users use the site to help them understand what is happening in the world. So the data here, 51% uh, are finding out how to do things they haven't done before. So you just bought a, you know, a used Toyota Celica, you wanna know how to change the oil, you go on YouTube, somebody has made a video, probably 12, on how to change the oil on a Toyota Celica. You know, you want to learn how to, you know, change your shock absorbers on your, you know, 1984 Yugo, you can probably find a video to do that as well. So the most common use, 51%, is to find out how to do things. But the 19% is for news and information about issues. Well, that's a tremendous number of people when you consider there's 197 million YouTube users in the United States alone. 20% of that means 40 million people who are going online to understand about the world and about issues. Even more important, in terms of what influences people, people's perceptions, 55% of how people draw perceptions comes from the visual, 38% from, uh, from the vocal and 7% uh, from the verbal. So it's vitally important that we as a movement and all of our organizations have a strong presence on YouTube. And you might think, well, you know, there's look at all of these different organizations. Uh, everyone's generating stuff. I'm sure, you know, we're in great shape. Well, in anticipation of this presentation, I ran a couple of searches on YouTube. So one, I did a search for how to cut taxes. So let's say I'm some millennial staffer in some parliament somewhere, and my boss wants to come up with a tax cut. How do I cut taxes? Well, nothing on the first several pages of a YouTube search here in Australia on how to cut taxes has anything to do with how to cut taxes. Every search on this topic produces a result on how an individual can cut their own personal taxes, but not for how government can cut taxes whatsoever. 
Well, that's an opportunity for us to close in on. Number two, I was went a little more specific. How to cut the value-added tax, nothing. Furthermore, I couldn't find anything uh, in the top search results to ex that from a pro-free market perspective explaining what a value-added tax is. Well, think about this. We are all experts in taxes. Wouldn't, shouldn't we be the resource who's showing people and educating people about what a tax is, what a value-added tax is, what a tariff is? Do we want to be educating people or do we want our friends on the left to be doing it? I did a search for this, Liberal Party tax cut. So what comes up, number one, the number one search result on a YouTube search of Liberal Party tax cut is an article from The Guardian, which probably sucks, uh, uh, Liberals unleash online scare campaign on new labor taxes. You know, technology is... Okay, hold on a second. Okay, so even after the recent election, look at these top results uh, you know, on YouTube here. Nothing that is particularly favorable to our point of view. So clearly, as a taxpayer movement, there's a tremendous opportunity which we're missing uh, on YouTube. So how can you, as a taxpayer leader, create an effective YouTube strategy? Well, here's a couple of points. Number one, your organization should be extraordinarily well-defined on YouTube. Now, is anyone here with ManCal? So I did a search for ManCal on YouTube, and you guys got a gold star, because you have a YouTube channel, and every single video that came up on the first page of results was produced by ManCal. So ManCal on YouTube is defining itself, as opposed to having other people define that. Now, one of the things you can do is if your main opponent is some trade union or some you know, communist party or whatever it happens to be, you can also generate YouTube content, tag it to their name so that when people look up your opponents, they, they're, they're seeing content that you've produced so that you're working to define your opposition because they're doing it to us all the time. So number one, your organization should be extremely well defined. Number two, YouTube should, you should, your organization should be a resource for YouTube users on the issues that you care about. So you're fighting taxes on cigarettes, uh, you're fighting regulations on vaping, you're fighting stupid tariffs, you're fighting an increase in the tax. Is, has your organization made itself a resource so that if someone is looking for information on that topic and they type the name into YouTube, that they're gonna come up with your content as opposed to someone else's content? Or even worse, just bad content. Next, optimize your content for search. So you probably heard of the term search engine optimization that usually refers to how you can ensure that in a Google search that your results come up near the top. Well, the same applies to YouTube. So you should make effective use of tags and other methodologies to maximize, uh, maximize that. Promote your content through strong SEO practices, meaning Google, Google, which owns YouTube and has for many years, one of the ways that YouTube determines whether to drive up a particular video in the search results is how many inbound links that video has, meaning how many pages on the internet are linking to that video. So if ManCal, for example, uploads a video to YouTube, it should not stop there. ManCal should then go to its website, post that video there, and then create an inbound link to that YouTube video from their website. The more high quality inbound links exist, the higher the result is going to be. So I wanted to show you uh, this video. If you were in my session yesterday, this is the video I also wanted to show uh, yesterday. How many people in the room are very familiar with a group called Jewish National Fund? Okay, one, two, three, okay. So most people in the room are not familiar, that's good, because I wanted to pick a, an organization that I knew something about. I serve on their, on their board in San Diego. I'm not Jewish myself, but I'm involved in the issue. Uh, and so here is uh, an example of an organization defining itself extremely well on YouTube. Let's take a look.
investing in established communities, giving them the opportunity to grow. And helping new ones rise from empty desert. We are bringing the next generation of leaders to Israel. And helping ancient communities adapt to a new millennium. Thanks to Jewish National Fund, tourism is flourishing in the Galilee. Be'er Sheva is the fastest growing city in Israel, and business is blooming in the sands of the Negev. We are forging the future our founders only dreamed of. We are not only philanthropists, we are entrepreneurs investing in the future of a country, of a people. Our work today ensures that the Jewish state thrives tomorrow. Join us as we build a nation. Join us as we build a nation. Join us as we build a nation. We are Jewish National Fund. We are Jewish National Fund. Your voice in Israel. Israel. How many people in the room now believe, do you believe that you have a, some idea as to what that group does? Right? So very, very well done. Uh, and uh, why does that video have high impact? Well, a couple different things. It's authentic. There's no actors. Right? So never use stock footage of, uh, never use stock video of people. And never use stock pictures of people because they look fake. Right? It's, uh, no, nobody in politics is that good looking. Um, so. It's authentic, it's interesting, it defines the organization through its work. Um, there are people, uh, there, it, it, on the qualitative level, you see people who are actually involved in the projects, you see actual sites. This was not done in a studio. There's not a single scene that's in a studio. In this case, there's not a single scene, uh, except for the end, uh, that's inside. And there are no bed elements. There's no actors, no stock footage, uh, and no studio. Uh, this piece runs a total of three minutes and 43 seconds, which is fine. Everyone always says, keep a YouTube video to under two minutes. But when you're dealing with an interested audience, you can go longer. You shouldn't go an hour, but you can go, you can go longer. 28 seconds is dedicated to the introduction, two minutes and 43 seconds on what the organization does, and then the call to action at the end running 30 seconds. So you see a pretty interesting, you know, visually interesting piece, but take a look if, a little bit deeper. If you take a look at the typical shot in that video, it does have numbers and data points, but they're put off to the side. So you see the name of the person speaking and their affiliation, that adds credibility to what people are seeing. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see statistics and data points, and on the top right, you'll have the location where that particular shot was taken. So very, very good. So the emphasis is on the person who's in the middle of the screen. So it tells the human side of the story letting the people tell the story of the organization as opposed to the data, because that's what's more compelling. People want to watch video of people, not of pie charts, not of flow charts, et cetera. So a couple of tactics, and I'll close up with this. If your organization does not have a YouTube channel, you should create one. So that's a checklist item. Number two, create high quality video on key topics. Define your organization, and then topics that you care about, Put some video content up and make sure that they're organized into well-titled playlists. So if, there's a, if you put together a couple of videos on value-added tax, call the playlist value-added tax because that is more likely to show up in a search of that particular uh, subject. Use robust descriptions and tag the videos effectively and maximize your use of the comment section to increase engagement. So you could put up a video, for example, on you know, ways to cut government waste. And you might say in the video, uh, have you seen government waste in your part of the country? Let us know in the comments and encourage people to comment because the more engagement you get in the comments, again, that's another data point that's going to drive that result, uh, that's going to drive that result uh, ultimately higher. 
Um, so you can optimize, uh, you know, optimize your uh, your uh, your content. Um, make sure that you use a description. So use the description of the video and make sure that that description has words which people may be searching for. Um, create a title with the most searched for keywords. So if the title of the of the video is kind of overly clever and it's not clear, then it's not it's less likely to come up in a search uh, on that. So be aware, uh, be aware of that. So I will be happy three minutes. I will be happy to send you a copy of this presentation. All you have to do, uh, you can send me a message through the Whova app, uh, and I'm happy to send you. Was, has this been helpful so far? Okay. If you send me a message and include your email, I'll send you a copy uh, of the presentation. So that's all the time I have. Thank you very much. Look forward to the discussion. Thanks for having me. Um, I am going to talk about Facebook. I'm going to talk about it specifically in uh, using Facebook to build an army of as I would call, I guess, taxpayer activists and then donors. But it doesn't have to be taxpayer groups. I know there's lots of taxpayer groups that are here in this room. But no matter what campaign you're running, whether you're trying to, uh, you know, your local university going after, uh, trying to win a seat on your student union, whether you're trying to uh, legalize mushrooms, uh, whether you're trying to uh, uh, take on any one of these uh, projects that uh, you might take on in your, uh, in your, in your careers and your activism, uh, Facebook is the best tool to do so. And I, I say that in, in that um, needing to build an army is the key to winning these campaigns. Um, because as Ronald Reagan once said, and this is my favorite Reagan quote, is when you can't make them see the light, make them feel the heat. And I, I love this quote so much in that I believe, uh, I, I've met with, I don't know, uh, 100 politicians in my career, and I've yet to meet one that said at the end of this, uh, boy, you're a lot smarter than me. Uh, please tell me more about how I should do your, this, my job. Um, well, the way that you often convince politicians to uh, change, uh, change policies, change laws, is by convincing them that there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even if you're in a small area, even hundreds of people that are, are also believing the same thing. And that's uh, what I want to talk about today. So where do you find people? Where do you find people uh, to join your, your army to, to fight your fight with you? Well, you, as another, another saying, probably an American saying as well, a Canadian using all the American stuff here, you hunt where the ducks are. You go to Facebook. That's where the ducks are. Uh, Facebook has 3 point, sorry, 2.38 billion uh, monthly active users, over 1.5 billion daily active users. And the beauty of Facebook is that 85% of users on Facebook are, are no longer just in, in North America. And as you can see from this map, this is a map of the number one social network in each country. So unless you're in a couple of those countries that aren't blue, Facebook is your, uh, your best option for finding people. Um, and so when you find these people or, or trying to find these people, getting them to be, be part of your army, it's, it's a permission marketing step. And this is basic permission marketing that I'm going to walk you through here starting with a stranger, uh, working them all the way through to becoming an activist and a donor to your, uh, to your campaign. So you're going to see this chart a bunch of times. So uh, step one, well, get them to like a, a, a post of yours. That's it. Just, that's, let's just get them to like one of your posts. Um, how to do that? And I'm, I'm not going to get uh, too deep into this because I know Ben's going to be speaking a lot about uh, uh, getting into how, how you can be most effective on on Facebook and getting people to engage with your content. Uh, just I'll say this really quickly. Uh, the four things you can do is share engaging content. Now, it sounds uh, obvious. Uh, don't share boring content. But I mean engaging as in uh, engagement. And that's a very interesting metric that Facebook uses. And Ben's probably going to talk about that. I won't, I won't even go to there. Wait for that. It's a, that's a, it's a teaser for Ben's uh, presentation. Um, two, share original content. Uh, it's one thing to share other people's content. But if you have original content, uh, it certainly will perform often uh, quite well. This is one that I'm very passionate about. It's uh, making multiple people on your team content curators. Uh, a lot of us like to be very controlling with our Facebook page. We have one person in charge. They're the only one that posts. Uh, I'd say don't do that. Uh, let as many people on your team share content. Uh, obviously, set up what you want your page to do. Set out the ground rules and let your team, trust your team to share uh, content on there. I, I don't know how many times I've gone to our Facebook page, seen some content that I had no idea existed, and I was so happy that well, someone on our team put it up there because we would have never put it up if we didn't give uh, our team uh, full control. In fact, we even let our interns, once, they, once, they can, once we've seen that they know uh, what our rules are, we'll let our interns post stuff. Um, and it's, it's a highly effective way of doing things. 
Lastly, use uh, humor and anger as a good way to get people to like your posts. These are a couple of examples. Uh, late last year, I just went and pulled the three most popular posts that we had. Um, funny, funny, and then, well, actually, they're all funny, uh, but they make people angry in, in some cases. The bottom one here, just an explanation. This is one of our, uh, one of our, our staff came across a parade in, in one of these towns where the Green Party had a giant cube, gas-guzzling cube truck driving around advertising for the campaign. So uh, we took a, a video uh, uh, of that. So these were popular uh, humor and, uh, and anger, what often is a way to get people to engage with your content. So once you've got someone to like a single post, then you want to get them to like your page. Because if they like your page, there's a higher chance they're going to start seeing your, your other content. And I, I, um, I would say there's, uh, obviously you're gonna have people who like your, your pay, uh, like your post and then immediately go and like your page, but that's not necessarily always the case. Um, the way, one, of, one way, one uh, fairly effective way to get people to like your page is to ask them to like your page, invite them to like your page. And Facebook, if you have under 100,000 uh, likes on your page, they'll, they give you this option here. So you can click on the number of likes on a post uh, right there, they usually will have some people's names of your friends. And then it'll pop up a box where it tells you which people there can be invited to like your page. And you can click on it and they get sent a notification saying, um, if it's a friend of yours, it'll say, Scott Hennig has invited you to like this page. If it's not a friend of yours and you're just a page moderator, it'll say the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, which is our group, or your group's name has invited you to like their page. Now, not everyone does that. Uh, but we, what we found, especially in the beginning in doing this, uh, for the early days, around 30% of all of our new page likes came as a way of, uh, by way of inviting them to like our page. Later on, when we'd been doing this for years, uh, it, it dropped to around 8%. But even at 8%, you're picking up quite a few people if you get a very popular post. And you can see this one here had over 3,000 likes. Uh, we had, I, I would say on this one, we probably ended up having uh, four or five hundred people we could invite on a single post and uh, and we were able to to generate quite a few people through that once you hit a hundred thousand then you're you're locked out of this um, so now that you've got people to start liking your page uh, show them content that will uh, not only engage with them but also get them to give you some information so uh, I love Facebook but Facebook when they have your your uh, people who like your pages information they keep it they don't share it with you necessarily um, you can't email them, you can't phone them. So you have to find different ways to get more of their, of their data. Um, we find one of the most effective ways is using petitions. So we'll show them uh, a post. We'll just start putting posts on our page about petitions. Here's one that we put up about the carbon tax. Uh, people click it, so redirects them to our website where they can sign a petition. They can give us their email addresses, their names, their phone numbers, all of their data so that we can contact them. Um, and if you don't have your own website that you can easily generate petition pages from, there are lots of good resources out there. Uh, so if you're a small or a new organization, uh, you can use, uh, Facebook has their own uh, called Facebook Leads Ads. You have to pay for them, but you can basically create a petition where you can gather people's data right within the Facebook uh, tool. Um, Nation Builder is a great one, one of the better uh, options, although fairly expensive in terms of uh, creating petitions. Uh, Instapage is another good one, and uh, change.org, it's a bit of a lefty site, but it's free, and they'll give you all the data. Uh, so I, if, you're, if you're really doing a grassroots campaign from scratch, uh, I recommend change.org as a, as a good option for gathering people's data. Um, one other tip for you on this, uh, if you do have your own web page, uh, unclutter your pages when it comes to getting people to sign your petitions. You'll have a much higher uh, a, a much higher acquisition rate or completion rate. Uh, this is an example of our site. This is in French. We have a French version of our site as well because Canada is bilingual. Um, the one on the far side there is uh, our original page. Uh, I think we counted at one point there's about 75 options for people to leave this page once they come to sign our petition. Uh, on the, on the left-hand side here is uh, a really stripped-down version where they have no option to leave our page once they come and, and sign a petition. Um, significant significantly higher conversion rates, uh, getting people to, to uh, sign up when you have a very uncluttered page. Okay, so they've signed your petition, um, and this is, this is where uh, we maybe vary from other groups. Um, we segment, we have so many issues we work on that we really segment our lists. So if someone comes in on an issue of carbon taxes, 
and we happen to be working on a free speech issue, we won't necessarily share the uh, information about uh, free speech with the people that are interested in carbon taxes because we run the risk that we'll lose those people from our list. So this may not be for you, this may not be a case for you, but for us, we uh, try to then get people to join our main list. So indicate to us they're not just interested in a single issue, but they're interested in multiple issues. So we give them an option when signing a petition to join our main list. Um, so you can you can have a checkbox right on your petition if you're setting it up to, to join your main list. That's what I recommend. Once they're on your main list, or even if they're just on your petition list, engage with them. Get them to start taking advocacy actions. Those things can be attending a rally, um, uh, sending a, an email to a politician, phoning a politician, writing a letter, um, all kinds of different things you can get people to do once you've got them on your email list. And we send out emails, uh, very plain text emails. Um, and I recommend that insofar as that, uh, write your emails the way that you would write it to a friend, not the way you would write it if you're, uh, if you're uh, a corporation. So my friends, I don't generally put a lot of graphics at the top of my emails when I send them uh, information. I also put in uh, normal links. We hyperlink a little bit, but generally where we want people to click, We'll put the whole hyperlink in there because that's the way you would send it to your friend. You, you would not hyperlink some text within an email to your friend. So if that's, the, if that's what the action you want them to take, uh, put it very clearly for them. So engage, get them engaged in your, in your campaign. Get them engaged in taking action and feeling like they're part of, of, of the army that you're trying to create. Um, and once they've done that, well, then you can go back maybe after they've taken some action and become really invested and ask them for money. So we also send them emails very similarly. Um, best way to ask for money is, is to have a reason for needing the money. Uh, so not just asking them for, hey, we like money, uh, give us some, but hey, we've got this great thing we could do if you gave us some money. Uh, here's all the great things, please, here's an easy way to give us money. Um, and once they've done that, uh, you can try to start converting them into someone who's regularly donating because they've seen the benefits of, of joining and being part of your army. Um, and we do this very passively as well. Every time we send a, an advocacy email, an email out to our support list asking them to take uh, an advocacy action, we always put a PS in saying, also, don't forget, we're a nonprofit and we like money, so maybe give us some money. And, and that doesn't turn into large uh, dollars for us, but it certainly is a reminder to folks consistently that you're a nonprofit organization and you, and you rely on the support of, of people like them. Um, now, once you've done that, once you've got these people on, and I'm almost near the end of my presentation here, um, you can then use the tools within Facebook to, uh, to go back and, and start getting similar people in. Uh, Facebook has a really good tool called Lookalike Audiences. So you can take your own list, uh, so lists of people that have signed your petition or have joined up to be part of your army. You can show that to Facebook privately, I think. I presume they promise it's private. You upload it to them. Uh, they will look at those people and give you an audience that looks very similar to that that you can then run advertisements to. And uh, generally speaking, you have a much higher conversion rate with those people than you will uh, shooting at the regular population. Um, so I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a highly effective way to get a very good audience that you're showing your ads to and get a, a much lower cost uh, per click and cost per conversion when you're, when you're looking to get people on there. And then, of course, when, they, when you show the, uh, those audiences, these new audiences, you're, you're sort of skipping the first three steps and showing them right to your petition. You can then, again, start the whole process again, invite them to be, join your organization, start the whole process over and over and over again. Um, that's, the, that's the permission marketing in a, in a, in a, in a quick uh, 15 minutes. I will uh, plug a couple of other sources and other resources for you. Um, of course, the Leadership Institute has lots of great online courses and in-person in courses that you can take. Uh, lots of good social media ones, especially they have, if you're really new to social media, they have some very good intro courses that you can take online. Um, my personal favorite organization on this stuff is uh, Next After. They're, probably no one's heard of this organization. They're a, a Dallas-based uh, organization. Uh, I think they are the smartest uh, people in the world when it comes to doing uh, nonprofit, uh, nonprofit fundraising, optimization, online, uh, online fundraising. Uh, they have lots of good free resources, tons of good webinars. At least uh, once a month they have a fantastic webinar that you will absolutely learn something crazy you never even thought to do. In fact, I just took one, uh, took, last one I took I think it was in December because I haven't had a chance since. But 
I learned that uh, you can use Facebook to prime direct mail audiences uh, to give you more money. So anyways, it's one of their many tips. And lastly, uh, Ad Espresso, which is one of my favorite tools. Uh, if you're running, if you get to the point where you're running a lot of Facebook ads and you need uh, some extra help, tools like Ad Espresso will let you run up to like 120 versions of an ad to find out which one works the best and automated without having to do all the hard, heavy lifting yourself. It costs money, but it's a highly effective tool. That's it for me. If you, uh, similarly, if you'd like a copy of this presentation, send me an email and I'm happy to uh, share it with you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Scott. Thanks very much. Um, g'day, everyone. Um, I'm Ben. I'm from TG, or Topham Gearin, and we run political and non-political campaigns around the world. Most recently, um, last weekend, we had a relatively successful result here in Australia, um, and we had a digital team embedded uh, in the Liberal Party that helped to get uh, the result that made most of the people, I think, in this room relatively happy. Um, there are still a few here that are, are not such fans of the Blue Socialists. Um, the, so I'm based in London. My company's based in Auckland, and so we do stuff primarily in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, um, and a range of other places as well. Unfortunately, I have to dash to the airport straight after this presentation, but I'd love to answer your questions. So if you um, flick me a tweet or a direct message, um, I'll also share these slides in the um, app afterwards. So there's two questions that I fundamentally want to answer today, because we could all go on about social media for hours. Uh, the first one is how do you win the battle of the thumbs? And this applies on Facebook, this applies on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. How do you get people to pause on your content when they're scrolling through at rapid fire pace? And secondly, how do you turn your, turn your channel into a community? Imagine a number of the organisations represented in this room have you know, all sorts of social media accounts, Facebook groups, LinkedIn company pages, all that sort of thing. But just having a social media channel isn't the same as owning a social media community and we're going to get into how you turn one into the other. So onto this first question, how do you win the battle of the thumbs? Firstly, you've got to work out what you're dealing with. The average consumption time on social media is 1.7 seconds on mobile. These are Facebook statistics. 1.7 seconds per piece of content on mobile. On desktop, you get a little bit longer. You get two and a half seconds. Now, the reason why it's shorter on mobile is that you've got 100% of your audience's attention because you're staring into their phone. It's a small screen. They're only looking at one piece of content. If you're on desktop, you think about how the Facebook page looks on desktop, you've got all sorts of distractions. It takes a little bit longer for people to get their attention around you. Our challenge is when we've got 1.7 seconds, what on earth do we do with that time? How do we capture someone's attention to get them to stop long enough on our content to process it, to react with it, to interact with it, and then share it with their friends? So the first thing we have to be aware of is that people aren't perusing our content at a leisurely pace. They're scrolling through it, looking forward to the next kitty picture. And we've got a uh, kitty picture, to clarify. So we've got to do something to, to, to stop them along the way. So uh, I'm sure people put lots of pictures of their kitties on Facebook as well. It's, it's a family tool. So the, the, the second thing that we've got to be aware of is that video is king. And I'm really glad that um, Ron uh, did his presentation on, on the role of YouTube. YouTube is an incredibly valuable resource for all of us. We should all be using it. Um, video on Facebook is also, th this is another Facebook statistic, um, people spend five times longer on a video content than they do on graphic. If you've got an idea for a policy graphic which is, you know, tax has gone up 20% under this government, you can put that on, a, on a, a, you know, a graphic, or you can have a five second video that says exactly the same thing but the text animates on. And what happens when you put that content in video format is that it becomes eye catching. No, not only that, but it also becomes a, a beneficiary of the Facebook algorithm. Facebook knows that people are more likely to watch videos than they are graphics, so give them a video. But there's exactly the same content in video form and it's going to go further than if it was a graphic. This is the single most important point. The best social media strategy is water dripping on a stone. You've got to be pushing the same consistent message day in, day out. The challenge is to use a variety of content to do so. So what, what does this mean? Right? What, like, what, what does it mean to have a consistent message about a variety of content? Every single piece of content that you push up on your page should be advancing whatever your objective is. Now, in the most recent um, Liberal Party campaign, the objective was getting across that uh, you know, Bill Shorten was you know, the bill Australia couldn't afford. He was going to raise taxes, and these taxes were going to cost families. And what happens when you raise taxes? You've got less money to spend on other things. That's the message. Now, you can display that message in all sorts of ways. You can have a detailed breakdown of a quote that he said in an event, and you can have a quote from an economist. That's one way of doing it. 
You can have a picture of a dog and next to it saying tax is bad. We also did that. Guess which one had more engagement? Exactly. It's the variety of content is key, but, it, but, but what they had in common was they had a consistent message. So what does this look like in practice? On the left, we have a couple pieces of great content. They're on brand, they've got nice photos, nice imagery, the good fonts. That's straight out of the style guide. That's brilliant stuff. And those, those got really, really high levels of engagement. On the right-hand side, we got two memes, which each took about five minutes to produce. The, one, the first one on the left has been so crudely photoshopped that you can actually see the guy behind Bill Shorten's head. head. The tax, there's actually like a gap. You can't, might not be able to see it on the big screen, but it's like a really crudely like white rectangle behind the tax, covering the language behind it. The one on the right is one of my all-time favorites. That is a screenshot of a PowerPoint slide that someone who wasn't even on the digital campaign pulled together. Like, and that's using Calibri font. Both of these memes on the right perform better than the two tech graphics on the left. So what's the lesson here? Style guides are the death of engagement. If you're desperate to make sure that everything you do is compliant with your head of creative, then people aren't going to find what you're doing particularly interesting. You've got to surprise people. You've got to shock people. You've got to unlock and arouse an emotion in people, right? People talk a lot about engagement, and engagement is a response of emotion. We all know that, right? Like, we're not going to interact with something if we don't care about it. But the particular emotions that we need to unlock are arousal emotions. We're talking anger, excitement, pride, fear. Your content should be re relating to one of these emotions for anyone to give a damn about it. And so in the, in, in the example on the left, we've got the, the, the very first one is, is just a plain education, education um, announcement. It's funny because it's a pun in the name, right? So it's like slightly more interesting than saying tax is bad. Um, but it's, it's not particularly inter like interesting. The Your Choice one's slightly better because it uses contrast and makes it absolutely plain that if you vote for ScoMo, you get jobs, and you vote for Bill, you get tax. And the fact that this is reiterating the message that's being pushed out every single day on the campaign makes it convincing. But on the right-hand side, we're using humour. Right? We're taking it for granted that everyone knows that Bill's all about tax. We're moving one step on from that. What happens when you know that everything's about tax with Bill? Ah, oh, well, you know, you've got the dad joke meme. You've got the, the fact that he's been compared to Daenerys Targaryen. I, mean, I think that's a compliment, actually. I think she's, you know, achieved wonders in the Game of Thrones world. But um, the, the point is here that we, we're sort of unlocking different ways of talking about the issue, but every single thing that we're doing is relevant to the key message. So we've got to work out how do we unlock these arousal emotions so that people care about our content. And when they care about it, they're going to do a couple of things. They'll like it. They'll comment on it and they'll tag their friends. They'll share it with you know, their own audiences. And that's how we build our audience. That's how we convert our supporters. That's how we find people that are on the fence and make up their minds for them. It's as simple as that. The next test that we have to put our content through is we've got to make it relevant and salient. And they're two different things. Relevant is making it in a, presented in a way that's relevant to an individual person. I don't care if there are 100,000 Australians that are going to be affected by this policy. I care if I'm going to be affected by this policy. And you've got to tell me why it's going to affect me. And that's our challenge as campaigners. We've got to make our issues relevant in a way. So rather than talking about a $10 billion deficit, talk about what happens when you're running a deficit. What happens when you can't you know, um, invest in services that matter for people. You've got to make every post as personally relevant as it possibly can be. Otherwise, why am I going to pause? Why am I going to spend any longer than 1.7 seconds looking at your content? The second point is salience. Like stuff can be personally relevant, but if it's not on the back of what people are talking about at the moment, if it's not part of the zeitgeist, then it doesn't matter. So the best content, given that we've already know, we already know it has to be consistent with your message and it has to be relating to an arousal emotion, is that it's going to be relevant and it's going to be salient. So given that, I'm using the example of a head-to-head -head digital contest. Now this isn't always a scenario. Right. Sometimes what we're doing is simply you know, advancing you know, a non-profit cause. Sometimes what we're doing is you know, a little bit softer. But where social media matters most is when you're in a head-to-head -head contest. For example, the final three months of an election campaign where everyone thinks you're going to lose. So how do you win? There's three factors that matter. Firstly, volume. It's an arms race for who can dominate the news feed. And if your opponent's starting to catch up, it's time to crank it up a notch. In the peak point during the campaign, we were posting 30 posts a day and more than 200 or 250 a week. That means you have to generate and publish a new piece of content every 20 minutes. That's how you get what we call the boomer memes, 
because you had to crank stuff out quickly. You couldn't spend too long doing a perfectly created, like artisanally perfect graphic. You're going to slap some Calibri font on a shitty, you know, re reused meme, and you're going to publish it, and then you get on to the next one. And you know what? That content's going to do better than the thing that your poor graphic designer spent a week on. Sad but true. So you've got to work out how are you going to unlock the volume. How, and, and, and what we saw in the campaign is, is, as soon as we started posting 100 posts a week, the Labour Party digital team started to get pretty stressed out. Right. And it took them a few weeks to catch up. They clearly hired another couple of graphic designers, brought another couple of people onto the team, sped up their content processing, um, processes, and then they started to catch up. But by this point, we were already at 150 posts a week. And, but basically, because they were so complacent at the beginning of the campaign, thinking that because they were left-wing, they were going to win the war on the internet, they never invested where it mattered in making sure that they had the processes, the strategy, the tactics to win on digital. What happened? We posted more. We got about twice as much engagement um, on both Bill's, uh, on Shorten's page and the Liberal Party's page. And that's how you win share of voice. And when most of that's concentrated in marginal seats, that's how you win an election that no one thinks you're going to win. The second one is variety. So it's really, really easy to get into a routine of, oh, yeah, we've got Bob, the graphic designer. He's bloody brilliant. And he does these graphics, and they're great, and he cranks out a couple a day. That's fine. But where are your memes? Where are your videos? Where's your live video? Where are your 3D photos? Where are your blog posts? What news articles are you creating? What other possible hypothetical piece of content that Facebook's going to create tomorrow are you going to be using, whether it's a poll or whatever else? We need to be using all the tools available to us to win the variety game. And again, it comes down to making your newsfeed interesting. If all you're posting is links to news articles, that's boring. I don't want that. If all you're posting is, you know, graphics that all look the same and all have basically the same message, again, not that interested. Give me variety, and this is also what the Facebook newsfeed rewards. So Facebook knows that if you're a publisher that's posting all sorts of different types of content, it's going to rate your content higher. In fact, volume and variety are two of the most influential inputs to the Facebook newsfeed algorithm. And thirdly is speed. And that's your ability to turn the silly comment that someone makes at a press conference into a viral video within hours. And this comes back to being personally relevant, right? And, and capturing the salience of the moment. If something happened 20 minutes ago, everyone's still talking about it. You can't afford to send it to an outsourced video team, wait a week, look at four drafts, eventually approve one, then put 50 bucks behind it and see what happens. You need to crank something out immediately Make sure it's good enough. We used the 80-20 rule. It became a, the motto during the campaign, which is, you know, you, you, um, if, if, if something's 80% good enough, you just got to get it out. Just got to get it out. So it's, oh, is the font just quite right here? Should we adjust the padding? We've spent more than half an hour on this piece of content. It needs to go out. And you know what? When you're doing 200 posts a week, no one worries about the one that had a little typo in it or the one that was missing a full stop. So you've got to be able to respond quickly. And that means that all of a sudden, issues that would otherwise have gone unnoticed, every campaign has blunders, right? Every campaign has blunders. But by being able to capitalise on them and turn these blunders into viral moments that stuck with people's perception of particular candidates, that's how you change people's minds. So those are a summary of some of the tactics that we can use to win what we call the battle of the thumbs. Plenty of interesting tactics there. I, I, I haven't wanted to go into too much detail because I know that Scott's done some brilliant examples of some of the things you can do about inviting people to like your page and all of that sort of stuff. And that's that's brilliant. But at a sort of uh, um, uh, you know in a head-to-head -head context, these are the things that we can do to get the edge. The second part of this is how do you turn a channel into a community? So we've done the hard yards, right? We're pumping out content, and it's a real variety of content. It's really interesting stuff. It's salient. It's relevant. It's emotive. It's all these great things. But we need to go one step further. A channel is a one-way broadcasting mechanism, right? It's a TV channel. You know, it, it, we're pumping stuff out. That's not good enough. Social media is inherently social. So our challenge now is to, t to make this interactive and to make people feel like they should, they're part of something bigger than themselves and that they're not just being broadcast to. And I, I like to think there's a three-step process that, um, that, that we can use here. The first one is we have to give people a reason to engage, right? Not just a reason to care about the content that we're producing, but a reason to engage. Now, that might vary depending on the content. Sometimes their reason to engage might be because it's so important they have to tell everyone. Urgency is a great factor in this, right? Like, importance is a great factor. Did you know? People love the did-you-know stuff, right? Because it, it's an excuse for them to tell their friends how, you know, that they're really onto something. 
So being able to offer something exclusive, something new, something that offers value to the debate is a really good reason to tap into people's emotional drivers for why they want to engage with content. One of the other things that you can do is loyalty. You make people feel like they're part of a movement. Some of the best content we did was literally just a picture of ScoMo and words, I stand with ScoMo on it. Well, we all do. He's a great guy. I, I stand with him. I'm a part of something bigger than myself. It's like backing a football club. It's like being part of a church. It's like being part of a, you know, a, a family, a clan, whatever. Absolutely, I'm going to share the heck out of that. So if you give a, people to en a reason to engage, then that's the first step towards building a reliable base. It's not enough. The next thing you have to do is create the conditions for them to engage. Now again, we're talking about likes, we're talking about comments, we're talking about shares. This is primarily about Facebook because um, as, as Ron said and as, as Scott said, it's, it's the biggest and most important Facebook um, social network. But a lot of what we're doing here also applies to Twitter, to LinkedIn, um, and, and to a certain degree to Instagram as well. When you're investing time and resources, even if you're not putting a lot of money into paid advertising, when you're investing resources into your Facebook page, you own it. It's yours. Don't let GetUp or some other outfit take it from you. It's your asset, and you need to defend it, and you need to create the conditions where people are going to participate in that community. Now, this might be a controversial opinion at a conference that values free speech, but sometimes you've just got to ban and block like there's no tomorrow. Because if people are creating the environment where your core supporters, your blue-blooded supporters, don't feel the need, don't feel that they can say what they think in a safe environment, that they're going to get attacked, then your supporters aren't going to get out there. We had this issue with Bill English in 2017, who was then New Zealand Prime Minister. He had incredibly low engagement on his page, because every time someone commented something, a left act lefty activist would chime in and attack them. Why do you hate this fascist? Well, A, he's not a fascist, and B, surely I should be able to say what I want on, on, on this guy's page. So we started, we started banning people, we started hiding comments, we started um, that, you know, creating an environment where you look at it and it was all positive engagement. You saw that you were part of a community and that gave our supporters permission to engage. They knew that they could engage because they were with like-minded people. But that's only half the step. The third step is what do you do when these people have engaged? You've got to react. Like their comment. You've got to reply. Tell them how much their comment means to you and how proud you are to stand, behind, to stand beside them and be part of the same community as them. And lastly, amplify. Don't let their comment go, go, you know, go and answer just sitting in the, in the Facebook comment section. Some of the best content that we used in the 2017 uh, general election campaign in New Zealand was when we did a screenshot of a comment that someone had left on Bill English's Facebook page. We got, um, pasted it as an image on Bill's page and drafted a reply from Bill. And we had a hashtag at the time, backing Bill. And this guy had done this whole spiel about he'd come to New Zealand as an immigrant, worked hard, and he was really proud to be backing Bill this election. So we got Bill English to flip it. And he said, it's people like you that make up the fabric of this country, people that are willing to work hard, people that are willing to get ahead, people that are willing to stand up for something and take risks. You are the people that I'm proud to represent, and that's why I'm hashtag backing you. It became a movement, it became a community. He felt that he wasn't just commenting on something for the sake of shouting into the void. He was speaking to the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister was standing up, shaking his hand and saying, I'm proud that you said that. This was incredibly engaging. We had outstanding response from the community, and it also created a feedback loop where people were more likely to leave comments on our page, more likely to send us messages, all of which were really positive testimonials for us in the campaign. So you've got to react, you've got to reply, you've got to amplify. That's how you reward your supporters. These are the three steps to how you build base engagement. You pull this off, and you've turned your channel into a community. Thank you very much. <laughs>